Welcome and thank you all for coming. We're going to start with um, a talk by Jay, and I just want to tell you a few more things about about Jay and how we got to this point. So we're looking really, if you think about it, how are we going to have a vision of New York City as a resilient city if we don't get together in small groups, bigger groups, work within our communities? If you, if you think about it, it's not going to happen. What's going to happen is we're all going to think that resilience means things like when a storm or another crisis happens, we have to have a go bag, and we have to have batteries, and we have to have water and canned food just in case we are stranded somehow. And that's important. I don't mean to demean that at all, but that's not enough, in my opinion. I hope you agree with me that we need to be more connected with each other. And we see how important that is when we see people in crisis in, in, on TV these days, right? So just planting that seed. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from uh, an article, just a little. Um, and um, there's, and also wanted to say there's another um, person that I would have liked to have here today, but she's out of town. Her name is Pamela Boyce Sims, and she's involved with um, the Mid Atlantic Mid Atlantic Transition Hub, and that's um, that's another nonprofit with the .org after it. So it's math Mid Atlantic Transition Hub. And she's sending out very nice newsletters about climate and environmental issues, and, and you can sign up and get them. And uh, she has a handbook, a guidebook, that um, maybe she'll give us a talk one day, and you can hear the model of the transition movement as they've evolved. And they have an idea about how to get groups together and follow certain instructions to come up with plans for their neighborhoods. Like they get together in small groups and plan. And that's one model. And um, there are many ways, but we need to be thinking, how do we make our neighborhoods more connected is, I think, important. And I'm, I'm interested to find out if Jay agrees, because Jay Jay's work is not directly about that, but he's working with the Office of Emergency Management. And so he's mostly focused on emergencies and crises, and you probably don't have a chance to focus on building community because you're focused on emergencies, right? But it would be, it would be helpful if there was more of a, a, of a resilient community. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So why don't you get started with what you have to say, and let's, let's hear what Jay has to say. And this event is, is going to be mostly a lot of Q&A. So when you have questions, let us know, and we'll, we'll get questions answered. We want to have a lot of questions and answers, and there'll be a whole official Q&A at the end. But in the meantime, if you have questions as the speakers are going forward, let us know. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Thank and you. thank you for coming. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is, um, I, you know, I was not aware of this group. This is a group that I, I, I'd like to go to a, a night like this even when I'm not at work. Mm -hmm. um, so this was really cool to find out. Mm -hmm. um, we meet once a month, by the way. First Monday is usually, but in, in September we don't have the first Monday available because it's a holiday. So that's why we're here on the second Monday. Can everybody hear? Okay. Okay, so my name is Jay Brandt. Um, as Susan said, I'm the Deputy Director of the Human Services Unit at New York City Emergency Management Department. Um, we in the Human Services Unit are uh, directly responsible for doing the planning and preparedness for the human, animal, uh, feeding and sheltering uh, plans for disasters, and I can go into that a lot more if anyone has questions. Um, the agency itself is a smaller city agency, so there's only about 150 people there. Um, there's about 300,000 total city employees. So we've got 150 people, and what our job is every day is to take the, um, by some counts, there's about 55 to 62 official New York City agencies, and those agencies have day-to-day -day jobs um, and none of those day-to-day -day jobs is responding to specific hurricanes and other emergencies other than life safety, like 
the police and fire. Um, and what we do is we ask those agencies to come to our office every every week of the year and do planning on the uh, the most catastrophic or or the most disastrous of events. So things that are outside of their day to day. So we never ask the fire department to come and, and talk about putting out fires or anything like that. We ask the fire department to come and talk about evacuating um, high rise buildings after Sandy to do things that they don't normally do, they don't normally plan for, um, but that the city sees a need to plan for. So as part of that, we have um, several different uh, units and, 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 and specialties. So we have transportation, infrastructure, utilities, public safety, things like that. Um, but our group, the Human Services Unit, specifically works with those agencies that, that, that care for people. So we work a lot with the Department of Social Services, um, the Department of Education, the uh, Department for the Aging, um, Administration for Children's Services, uh, and t most nonprofits, American Red Cross, Salvation Army, etc., fall under our um, planning purview. So that's a little bit about what the agency does. It's, it's kind of an odd agency in that um, not a lot of people know what we do. We're not actually first responders, so we're the Office of Emergency Management, but really we're the city's coordinating entity. So if you looked at an org chart of the city, We'd be not in any of the lines. We would be sort of up on the side. We're there to break down the silos. We're there to uh, connect the Department of Health with the Department of Transportation, which unfortunately uh, is something that those two agencies don't do very well by themselves. They, they don't really connect to each other very, very uh, um, skillfully. So we're there to get them together. So that's, that's my one part. I usually have a, a PowerPoint when I do these presentations because uh, these presentations are, are part of a, uh, um, a program called the Ready New York program. So that program is specifically geared towards uh, personal preparedness um, or uh, something that Susan mentioned is something that is very important to emergency managers but is not the final answer. Um, the, uh, the personal preparedness mission that we have at the agency brings us out to about 3,000 um, uh, events a year like this and around 500 or so uh, tabling events, so street fairs and other areas where we put up a table and give out information. It's a big part of the funding that we get as an agency to do these um, uh, presentations, and that's why I have brought these um, these these materials. However, uh, since I work in a completely different section, um, in, I'm in planning. Um, I'm here, and I would I would really uh, you know like to talk about a, a little deeper parts of the coastal storm plan today. But if anyone has any questions about these materials, um, I'd love to talk about that as well. I'll go over them just real briefly. The first one is the My Emergency Plan document. Um, this this is a a, a great. Um, Thing that you know kind of walks you through a lot of the common sense stuff that you've heard before um, connecting with neighbors writing down numbers making sure you have prescriptions captured and put into a waterproof bag all that great advice um, it's and it's in one place and I can say that I think a lot of folks um, look at this and they think I've done that I've heard this so many times that I don't need to go through it um, but it can be a, a really great tool to break down just maybe some odd communication barriers we've heard a lot of stories that um, by pulling this out and maybe talking to your family um, it got past an issue say where someone's mother didn't want to discuss evacuating before a storm um, but you know, if you pull this out, you kind of say, "Okay, mom, I'm just going to write it down." You know, I'm just going to have this conversation because we're we're going through this booklet, and then it, it made it a little easier. I know for me, um, I had roommates um, and friends before Sandy, uh, who I left to go to work that day, um, and the power went out, and they said. You're the worst, man. You didn't tell us anything about the power going out. And I said, you're right. We never had this conversation about all the stuff we should do because I just assumed that we all knew. Um, but no. Uh, so I, I brought these home, and we actually did talk a little bit about what to do with the stuff, what to do with our pets. Um, it's all in there. So um, I want to definitely recommend it. Um, and if you have a group that you're a member of other than this group and you're looking for a presentation that's sort of like the one I'm about to do tonight, but a lot more in-depth on that side, personal preparedness, you can easily request a personal preparedness uh, presentation um, from our agency at our website. 
and we will send out a person with as many copies of this in as many languages as you need, um, as well as a lot of other documents as well. And two requests that you would just go to the very last page or second to last page, which is the Get Informed page, and you'll have a, a link there uh, on top left to our website, and that website will bring you directly, uh, will, will get you the link to the Ready New York program to, to request a presentation. We do, we, we have funding to do them all over the city for any, for any group. Okay, so that's personal preparedness. Um, next, I just want to talk real quick about hurricanes. And Can I just sure. interrupt for a second? So if anybody, I think you brought extras. Did you bring some extras? Yeah? Uh, I did. I think I brought, I brought about 55 copies. Okay, so if you know somebody who you would like to give one to, we, we have at least one per person left that you can take when you leave. They're at back at the table, right? Okay, and I really encourage you to host events to start getting people together around some of this stuff. So, yeah, Thanks. go ahead. Okay, so hurricanes in New York City. Um, this is what uh, we work on the most at the agency for the last six years that I've been there. Um, we've got about 20 planners uh, that work on different aspects of hurricanes, um, starting with evacuations to the sheltering operation, feeding, temporary housing, moving into recovery housing, um, and, and many other portions as well, pets, etc. So I'd love to talk about all those things. Um, as the video mentioned, uh, the three main uh, sort of hazards that come from hurricanes are the wind speeds. Um, that's what gives the category number. Um, category numbers being an imperfect sort of description of, of a hurricane's strength and danger uh, because it only depends on wind speed. So for the city's hurricane plan, um, we consider it a, uh, a hurricane activation when we get tropical storm force winds of 39 miles per hour or above and when those sustained winds make landfall anywhere north of North Carolina. So it's a kind of an odd trigger. Um, but it's a trigger that has led us to turn on shelters for hurricanes um, Irene and Sandy. Sandy making landfall in southern New Jersey and us still turning on the plan is, is important that we just make sure that we turn on the plan when necessary. So um, it's tropical storm force winds. Uh, storm surge is the second uh, hazard we like to talk about a lot. This is the one that really got us in Sandy, the actual ocean pushing up against the New York Bight. So Long Island and uh, the coast of New Jersey make a make an angle. Uh, the the hurricane pushing up against that water pushes the water in, um, and that's why New York City has a directional hurricane um, a vulnerability. So if a hurricane is is aiming at us like this with New York City there, it'll hurt us a lot more than if a hurricane kind of swipes us up like Hurricane Irene did. And then the third one is flash flooding from from intense rains. Um, this is what uh, really just affected Houston in a big way, and it's, it's another hazard of, of a hurricane. And we can say, I know um, we talked a lot about climate change on the phone, and we've heard about it. Um, as emergency managers, we don't um, play politics. We lean forward into the disaster. So if someone told my bosses or me that there was a chance that climate change uh, you know, made a difference in hurricanes, we would, we would plan to that possibility. So no one at our office uh, has to either confirm or deny. I mean, I think we all, everyone I know uh, at the office believes um, completely that climate change is causing us to have much stronger and more frequent hurricanes. Um, but the, the, I think the beauty here is that for some agencies, like the Federal Emergency Management Agency, for instance, um, they've had to, uh, at least in their, in their vocalizations, pull back a little bit. We haven't had to do that at all. Um, we're not under any uh, jurisdiction where the federal government sh would tell us what, what we can and cannot uh, plan for or say. So we are expecting more hurricanes. We're expecting stronger hurricanes. Um, that's been part of our agency's mission since Sandy, for sure. Um, a little bit about the shelter system real quick. Um, there are... I'm going to sure. interrupt for another second. I just want to ask, when you say we're expecting more and stronger storms, hurricanes. Uh, what about this season? Because, I mean, after we've seen all this stuff on the news, I'm sure that's one of the questions people have. So sure. What, do you th what are your models telling you? And please tell people what you told me on the phone about how you come up with the plan and when you 
announce evacuations, just so they have a background on how the city operates a little. I think it's helpful. Sure, I'll give you. I'll give you the timeline. So, as far as the hurricane season, each year before hurricane season, we get a briefing from the National Weather Service. Um, the National Weather Service tries to give us an idea of what atmospheric conditions are going to look like in in the Atlantic over over the hurricane season. Um, and this year, they came and they said they were predicting an above average season. So all that means to us really is that there, if there's normally on average 15 named storms, so those are storms that get into hurricane force winds and then therefore get a name, um, this year we could expect uh, 18 to 20 in the entire Atlantic uh, basin. So what that said to us was there's gonna be a more, more sort of possibilities out there. We never know what the tracks are going to be until they form. Um, and even when they form, we often can't see the track for a good 10 days after they, after they start you know, rolling across the Atlantic. Um, so for that, that means that there's just there's lottery tickets, but the bad lottery. Um, more lottery tickets are going to be in play over the season, and we're going to be tracking more storms. So, um, so far in the season, we've so we're up to we're up to Jose, meaning ten named storms have occurred so far, and we're only into September. We look at the season as lasting until mid-November, so we have the rest of September, October, and into mid-November. Um, until the waters cool down enough where we don't see hurricanes as a threat. Um, so 10 named storms so far is a lot. Um, and uh, at this point, a few of them, when they first formed, we've looked at the computer models. I think uh, there's, there's something you guys may be familiar with called spaghetti models, uh, where they show uh, all of the computers in, in the world that do this work all come up with a track, and then you, you see them. Um, you can see those at a few of the websites in, in this book as well. They'll give you the, the latest models, um, but they show them on TV often as well. Um, so far, we've had a few of those models show that they may come to New York, and then as the days went on, the models all changed, and they, they pushed away from New York. So um, that is one thing I do want to mention, though. For an emergency manager, a hurricane is one of the easiest hazards to plan for. Um, we plan for earthquakes, terrorist attacks, um, gas explosions. These are the things that um, New York City sees as, as threats. Those are all what we would call no-notice events. So we have uh, no idea when they're going to happen, or when they're, you know, how to how to how to get people in place beforehand. A hurricane, we normally see ourselves as having a good five-day lead time of some certainty. That, we're, that we will be affected. So that five days is huge for us. Um, we get going on several things when that five-day timer begins. Um, in the past couple years, we've begun that five-day timer three times for Hurricanes Matthew, Hermine, and Joaquin. Um, on that five-day timer, what begins happening from a shelter standpoint and an evacuation standpoint is that at five days out, the city uh, convenes what's called a, a series, uh, the citywide Coastal Storm Steering Committee Task Force. We also turn on, in my group, eight tasks, task forces um, that, that we need to start talking to immediately. Um, what that means for you guys is that around four days out, the mayor should be on TV. He should be on TV talking a lot about evacuation and possible sheltering and then um, possible road closures and mass transit closures. So four days out, the mayor has to start saying some of that stuff, but he really doesn't know what's going to happen. And he started saying that stuff before those three storms, Joaquin, Hermine, and Matthew. Um, but again, uh, the National Weather Service talking to us, we don't know if it's going to come. So on day four, um, he, was, he was doing his job getting the public message out there. We were turning on all of our possible task forces, and that would be um, sheltering being the biggest one. That's uh, up to 400 uh, safe spaces, uh, all of them in city schools or CUNY colleges. Um, we, of course, don't need 400 for most events, but uh, we look at the minimum of 92 get turned on with any storm. So it's 92 facilities, um, over 8,000 staff per day to staff those facilities, and numerous uh, nonprofits and, and medical services that also staff them. So And volunteers. And a ton of volunteers, <laughs> right. yes, thank you. Um, uh, so at four days out, we were, we were uh, getting that turned on, and the biggest thing we do for that is the supplies. There's about 
um, $900,000 worth of supplies that go to those shelters when they get turned on. Um, the mayor does not want to send those supplies unless he has to, because if he sends them, um, we've got to buy most of them over again, or we have to pay to put them back in the warehouses. Um, so for all three of those storms, we got up until the day, which is day three, where he would have to announce a mandatory evacuation. So on, so on day three before, so that's negative 72 hours, as we call it, the mayor would go on TV and he would say, all right, everybody, in 24 hours, these areas will be evacuated. Um, one other thing that I brought here, um, which maybe a lot of you have seen, is our hurricane evacuation map. Um, we have six evacuation areas. Um, the uh, evacuation areas are numbered one through six, one being the most likely to evacuate. So you'll see a lot of common neighborhoods here, Coney Island, Rockaways, Red Hook, the Lower East Side, um, a, a lot of um, different portions of Staten Island as well. And uh, if the mayor goes on TV at three days out, he would be saying these neighborhoods and these zones now have a mandatory evacuation. Within 24 hours, we'd like everyone to leave those areas. But he can't ask anyone to leave until we've got the shelters opened. And um, that was part of what we just saw in Houston during Harvey. Um, part of the reason they didn't did not do an evacuation um, is because Houston has more people to evacuate than shelters that they could ever set up. Um, and that's, whether we agree, I think we don't take a side on it, but um, we really do believe in evacuation. Um, uh, it's the only way to prevent loss of life. It's the only way to, you know, absolutely say that uh, people can be safe in a storm. Um, but in any event, um, we look to open those shelters at negative 48 hours. So uh, unlike an earthquake or a terrorist attack, that's two full days to get everyone in the city out of those evacuation zones and into a safe space. Um, the city asks people to just come to the shelter for at least the night, for at least you know 12 to 24 hours while the storm passes. Um, and at that time, if... We, we assume, and I think the plan was written, that many people that evacuate will be able to go back to their homes. Um, but as we saw during Hurricane Sandy, a large number may not be able to. And that's when our office and several other offices that, that have just been created since Sandy need to start looking at housing recovery. So what I'll say is watch, you know, I think what, what we'd ask you to do is, is watch the news um, there are several resources you can sign up for, all put on uh, page 21 of this booklet, which are Notify NYC um, and the Advanced Warning System. Both will take your phone number as well as email address or text, and they will tell you uh, exactly what's happening during a coastal storm. Um, so those, those resources are big for us. Um, and that what we would ask is if you live in an evacuation zone and that zone is evacuated, that you go stay with friends and family as a first option. Um, this, the shelters can only hold so many people. It's, it's uh, 70,000 people in, a, in the smallest activation of 92, um, 92 shelters, up to 400,000 people if we turn them all on. Um, and we would, but uh, anyone that can stay with friends and family would probably be more comfortable there than in, than in a shelter. Um, but uh, we would ask that you that you go stay in the shelter and um, that you return to your home after, when you can. And if you can't return to your home, to visit another city uh, city plan, which is which is called the service center plan. Um, is that want, in the booklet? Uh, well, I won't I won't go into the service centers too much. But the oh. service centers are co-located facilities that we set up after building fires and hurricanes to get people the the. Uh, Federal, state, and local resources, as well as nonprofit resources that are available. And so, they're called service locators. Well, so that's another thing is that the mayor usually likes to brand those in a way. Uh, we actually started calling them service centers because um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg decided he didn't want to call them disaster assistance service centers, is what we normally call them. He wanted to call them restoration centers. Um, so we don't. Uh, we we like to just say they're called service centers. Um, but they'll, they will be made explicit when they're turned on. Um, so that is, that's a general timeline of, of the hurricane. Um, but I know I left a lot out that uh, completely does not talk about the recovery effort, which can go on for years and which is still going on with Hurricane Sandy. doesn't talk about mitigation efforts, which uh, are, are complex and require 
funding at the federal level to let us build uh, seawalls and um, interim flood protection is what we call it. Uh, but I can talk on a lot of that since our office deals with it. Um, and you also worked for FEMA at one time, right? I did. I worked for uh, I worked for FEMA when they were uh, in 2009 to 2013, uh, specifically on catastrophic disaster planning. So for the worst hurricanes and for the worst terrorist attacks, so nuclear attacks, etc. Um, it was a, a program that they that they created after Katrina to only plan for the biggest events, which uh, sometimes local local jurisdictions can't do. Um, yep, so that was my first four years. Thank you. I saw a question, Donna. Yeah, uh, I know that Stand up, Donna, so we can all hear you. I know that, number one, we're pretty fortunate as far as this area is higher up, so we don't get affected as much, but it doesn't mean that we won't be affected. I'm wondering, you said that city schools and universities are sheltered. Would that include here and, and the YMCA? Uh, no, so so since we can't um, control those buildings, nonprofit buildings, for instance, um, we don't we don't plan for them. We do ask nonprofits to to lend us their facilities often, and they normally do. Um, but since they can't give us sort of a blank check that they'll always give it to us, we only plan to use buildings that the city controls, that the mayor can say at any moment, we're using this, you know. Uh, get out. So um, near here, uh, John Jay College is an evacuation center, um, or not an evacuation center, oh, Lindsay's here. Um, sorry, uh, and, and Lindsay's seen this work firsthand, um, uh, working at John Jay, uh, but the High School of Graphic Arts and Communication, I believe, is maybe the, the shelter you were mentioning before, Midtown I, did, I never found out the oh. name of it, but it's in the West 40s, I think. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, and you can always go find your nearest evacuation center wherever you are uh, on our website at uh, nyc.gov backslash know your zone. Um, you can find the closest evacuation center. The service center that you mentioned, is that for people who need longer term shelter? Is that what you, the difference between regular shelter and service center? Yes, so the hurricane shelters are not, by their nature, designed to be, to be a, a, a temporary housing or a long-term housing option. What we really want to do um, is, is find all of the folks that now need long-term housing um, and, and get their eligibility status and get them into uh, different accommodations. Now, the city has a really hard time with that. Um, we work with uh, housing, housing Preservation and Development, or HPD, as well as the Department of Homeless Services to try to find any uh, open apartment space that they have. But after Sandy, and it'll happen again, most people went into hotels for a prolonged amount of time. Um, and then only uh, after a very long time did they get FEMA assistance or other state assistance to try and find more permanent housing. So we, yeah, we're still trying to work out that. that so I guess that's part of why the city sometimes gets a bad rap because the, the short term thing gets taken care of and then a lot of those people, and I'm not blaming this on you, I'm just saying that the people that I met at the shelter, I was there over a weekend, I was there for one 12 hour shift. There were thousands of people there. I don't know how many people they accommodated. And one of the things that I was asked um, on late Saturday night by a few of the people was, I said, is there anything I can do for you after I had talked to them for a while? And some of them had just tangible needs, like could you bring me some fruit? You know, because it was food and, and um, clothing if people needed, and there were toys for children and things like that. So one child asked me for a teddy bear, you know, like that. But one per, one teenager asked me, can you find out where we're going tomorrow? And I have to, I was amazed that this is a 17-year-old who's thinking ahead like that. And I wasn't thinking, where are all these people going tomorrow? Because she realized this was temporary, as in school is starting back on Monday. And this was a weekend in a school building. And it hadn't dawned on me that, you know, like they weren't going to get to stay for a while. And I, I also didn't find out from people where had they been before they got to this shelter, which opened on the weekend. And I forgot what day Sandy hit. hit. Do you remember Sandy. the day of the week? 
What? It was a Saturday. It was a Saturday. So where where did they go for a week before they got to that shelter? I'm not saying you know. I'm just saying it kind of dawned on me later. How did they survive? And that particular teenager, um, she was with her younger sister and her single mother, and uh, they had come from the Bronx, not to the shelter, but they had been evac evicted from their home in the Bronx because the mom had lost her job as a, a supermarket clerk. And they were evicted, and then they, the city found them a shelter, a family shelter that was more stable, where they, but they moved them to a whole other neighborhood on the Lower East Side or Chinatown. So they were uprooted from their, the children were uprooted from their schools, their whole communities, but at least they had a roof over their head. However, what happened was that shelter was evacuated. It was in the evacuation zone, now I understand. It was evacuated. So suddenly this was a second disruption within two months for this family's lives, and it was extreme disruption twice. As a psychologist, I know what that means to people. Those kinds of issues stay with kids, kids forever. You know, that's something that you know, they never feel as secure as they felt before after two disruptions like that. So it really broke my heart, and I thought about them afterwards many times. I still think of them, and I talk about them. Um, and I don't know what happened to them. Um, and the city also doesn't know what happened to them, because I've asked. So the city doesn't, I guess, have the resources, and I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm just saying that the city doesn't seem to have resources to track the people and provide ongoing services for everybody who comes to those shelters, because it's just too overwhelming to provide all those services, right? I mean, it's just... Well, one thing I'll say is we didn't uh, close any shelter until the folks there had a place to go. Um, a lot of shelters stayed open. I know, I, so I was at uh, a Brooklyn Tech High School um, working at a special medical needs shelter there, and it actually stayed, it remained a shelter after kids went back to school, which was... Uh, something that the principal was very upset about um, but we had you know the cafeteria and the kids ate in the room um, and the, so the the city of New York is also I think the only city that has uh, interpreted the state's constitution to the right of housing um, as, a, as, as a right for everyone so I have several friends I know that work for the city's department of homeless services there's a whole other conversation there about um, what, what that agency is doing and how they do but I know that um, you know they stay awake every night until there's a deadline at 3 a.m. where the judge they have to show that they housed every single person that asked for housing that night. Um, so I would hope that somewhere in the city, although they probably couldn't couldn't tell you because of hope, hopefully a HIPAA regulation or some other regulation, someone knows where those folks went. Um, I know we had a lot of shelters that couldn't close until the last 10 people got either a hotel room or uh, or extended stays with. Um, with the Department of Homeless Services, but I'm also sure that the city did some things wrong. So I wasn't the there until the end, so I can't speak to, you know, my experience was that I couldn't tell them where they were going when I left in the wee hours of Saturday night to Sunday morning, but they weren't asked to leave, I guess, until Sunday night. I don't know. I think the schools, the, some of those schools closed, though, right? Some of them. A lot of them uh, consolidated. So right. one thing the schools were asking to to close. So uh, we would bus two schools into I one. See. Okay, um, nobody explained that part. Yeah, yeah. I think the, it's a great point though that community-based organizations in general during Sandy did uh, work that far surpassed what the city could do. So Occupy Sandy was one of those groups and. Those organizations were able to do things that, because of bureaucracy and regulations, the city just could never have done. Um, I know we talk about doing feeding inside the zones, and that's a big push for the de Blasio administration. They don't, all of the shelters I should have mentioned are outside of the six evacuation zones. Um, uh, what, what's that? Right on the border. It's right on the border. Uh, we call it on the border. We no. Um, we we had a long conversation, but uh, it's um, it, it's uh, really important in some communities. Uh, we've learned, you know, that they won't evacuate, um, and we've gotten told that by city council members and other and other folks that there are neighborhoods that will not leave the zones. Um, not everybody, but a good a good amount of people, and in those cases, the the city in, in 
years past during Sandy said, well, we don't have any programs that go in the zones. We're not doing anything inside the zones because we set up everything outside. Um, and uh, that was short-sighted, I think, in a way that a lot of people stayed and the city wasn't prepared to go in and provide uh, anything for them. And uh, it, took, it, it took a lot of last-minute creative stuff to get in there. Um, now I can say that we do have many programs, um, a commodity distribution point program to bring food and water, medicine, um, blankets, and other things inside the zones, uh, as well as a post-emergency canvassing operation where people go knock on the doors um, of all the buildings that are inside uh, the evacuation zones, all the buildings without power. But I would still say that I'm sure the city um, will not be as nimble, will not be able to do as much great work as some community-based organizations are, are going to be able to do. And that's why it's so great to be able to have Jay here and Wendy here, because Wendy's working in a nonprofit way and is more nimble for sure in what she can do. And you'll hear about that in a little while too. Go ahead. Um, what are some of the reasons that people choose to stay or have to stay in the evacuation? So a lot of what we've heard is they. Um, they don't want to leave their homes for any reason. They're, and I know the, the common cause that some people talk about is looting or, or issues with leaving their things. Other people can't leave. I know there's, there's quite a few people who it's a, a big uh, lift and disruption to leave their home. Um, you mean for emotional reasons they can? Do you mean or physical reasons or both? What yeah. Do you mean? Well, so we we hear a lot about the physical reasons. Okay. Um, I think emotional reasons are are probably just as strong. Mm -hmm. I know in some communities it's seen as a badge of honor to not leave. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had a lot of meetings in Red Hook and Coney Island where they'll tell us there's they'll just say to me I'm not going to your evacuation center. Um, but I'm afraid I won't have enough food. And I said, please come to the evacuation center. Um, there's, you know, food, medicine. Uh, you can bring your pets, uh, and um, and you'll be guaranteed to be safe. Because, as mentioned before, uh, we we saw a study after Sandy that a, a majority of folks that actually died or were seriously injured from Sandy. It was because they left their homes um, into the waters or in, into the winds, um, or, they were, or they were trapped there. So if you leave the zone, um, you're almost guaranteed to, you know, to not lose your life. Um, and that's what we really want folks to do. So I think for us, we, we're, not, we're not always exactly sure why people won't leave, um, but we really want to convince them to. Sure. Do you have a Part of the department or you Speak have loud, Jill. Uh, disease control or, and toxic substances or radiation, uh, radioactive materials, checking for it and helping to vet that people have strange illnesses. Sure. So, well, so um, I think there's a maybe a couple different questions there. The the radioactive materials thing is a part of any nuclear planning that we do. So there there is a there is a section of our agency that does nuclear device explosion planning. Um, that's a really hard uh, plan because it's it, it's mostly focused on uh, first responders, so life safety personnel that's going into those zones after an explosion, and how you keep them safe. Um, and how you make sure that you're communicating to the public not to go in those zones. So they have the, they have the uh, I can't quite remember the name, but the, the meter. I think every police officer and, and fire department in the city has the radiation meter. Um, uh, so that's one of them. Uh, that's one of those. Another, so the, the, what they would call infection control or environmental health and safety is done by the Department of Health. Um, they have... Uh, so many folks. So there's 6,000 employees at the Department of Health. So they have um, just a ton of folks that come into all of our plans. So when we turn on shelters, I didn't mention sort of everyone that's at the shelter, but of course there are um, public safety officers, so school safety officers in the schools. But there's also an environmental health and safety person uh, from the Department of Health there that's um, looking out for MRSA, other uh, illnesses that thrive in those conditions with a lot of people. Um, I'm not, you know... I don't want to sound like I had all the answers because I I, re I don't, um, but but the city has so much capability. But I'm sure that there are many many holes in a in a true pandemic event or a, or a nuclear event. It would be a, a massive job, which I'm not sure anyone can say we would do perfectly. 
but there is plan. There are planners thinking about it. And what are the plans for people with disabilities? Um, are there any special plans? And does the city know who they are in advance? I don't imagine you do, but maybe you do. I so don't to, know how to, this works. Yeah, to some extent, we do know who they are. Um, the so the city was uh, also lost a lawsuit after Sandy that they did not do appropriate emergency planning for people with disabilities and others with access and functional needs. Um, that lawsuit, for planners at least, was uh, really beneficial um, because we lost it. We got a lot of we got a lot of money, or the or at least the mayor's office allocated money to do planning. Um, for people with disabilities. So uh, all of the shelters now are fully, well, all of the ev evacuation centers are fully accessible. Um, that's why John Jay College, for instance, is, there's, well, well it, not that you're not accessible. You're an accessible facility. But uh, we moved it into a, brand, into a newer school um, that, that didn't have a generator need or, or other things. Um, but I think what, what we know now is there is a list of vulnerable populations kept by the Department of Social Services. Con Ed actually has one of the best lists of people on life-sustaining equipment uh, that will be in, in danger if there's a, a power shutoff. And what the mayor's office asked us to do about three years ago was to put all those lists together. Um, so that was a coordination effort that we got all the agencies that had a piece to get together, put the list into a database with the same, um, with the same, uh, you know, data markers. The problem here is, um, is that once you collect that list, the city is on the hook to, to make sure those people are safe. And once you announce that you have that list, you've set the expectation that you have enough first responders to take care of those folks. And I'm not sure if the mayor's office is ready to. To, to fully say that yet, um, but it's something that we've that we've got, and I think the next step is still still waiting to be seen on what what we do with it. Thank you. Say your name and your group. So uh, I forgot Lewis, to ask you. Uh, with the water front lines, uh, we had about eight feet of water where we were. So for a month, we were working in the Rockaways, and there was no government for the first three weeks. It was really neighbors helping neighbors. I would think that you're talking somebody, about Sandy, right? Yeah, Sandy. I'm talking about Sandy. Uh, I would think that some evacuation zones have to be treated differently than others. You're not going to get those people off the Rockaways during an evacuation. Uh, you're going to have a fantastic pileup, and nobody wants to leave uh, in a pileup. So I would think that it would be better to have. Uh, various abilities within that particular area rather than keep them outside in an evacuation zone. And some of those evacuation zones, in fact, are threaded through a flood zone. So what can I say? But I wanted to change. And the other part of it was that the people there really were quite helpful. We came down and we, we did what we could do. But uh, the local community groups did everything they could do until government could arrive. Um, That's we a long were all time. Pushing <laughs> for the idea of having various nodes <clears throat> of human powered equipment stored so that people could get to them in the, in the middle of a problem, such as we used to have in World War II, civil defense areas. Um, it seems insane that when there is a major problem and you can't get out of it, that you don't have that equipment immediately available. And I'm talking about things like bicycles and shovels and things like that, non-electric equipment. So I that was just the comment I'm making. I'm going to change. And we're going to be talking about bicycles more when Wendy speaks, because she did something very innovative around that time. We would have given our left arm to have bicycles to be able to get from point A to point B. You're going to hear us. Can I put in one thing? Also, inflatable rafts. Whatever, things like that. Um, but there's more to an emergency in climate warming here in, in, in an era of climate warming than water, and that's heat. And one of the major problems that we're going to have as the summers go on are really hot summers, really hot summers. And have you guys done any work in that area? Do you have a trigger temperature 
for example, what you're going to tell people, okay, what the cooling centers are going to be open and they're going to be able to handle X. The same number of people that you might have to think about in terms of a storm are going to be affected by heat. Yep. Uh, so cooling centers, uh, another plan that, that my group uh, is, is responsible for. Um, the, the list that the mayor asked for three years ago was actually uh, triggered by a heat, a heat wave. Um, and heat events are the deadliest event. Uh, they kill more people than, than any other uh, natural hazard that we have. So we uh, take those seriously. The trigger for um, a heat event is two days of 95 degree heat index or above, or one, one day of, of forecasted 100 degree heat index or above. Um, that happened, I believe, for five days this summer, um, but three years ago it was 17 days. Um, it, it really fluctuates. But we, we do think very seriously about heat. I think there's, a, I think there's an issue around heat planning um, in that cooling centers are our number one tool that we're using now. And that's, um, for anyone that doesn't know, it's about 500 facilities, um, libraries, uh, Department for the Aging Senior Centers, um, Department of Youth and Community Development uh, Youth Centers, um, a bunch of public facilities that are uh, instructed to open their doors for absolutely anybody. Um, and those public facilities need to have uh, air conditioners. So when that happens, the cooling center finder on our website is turned on as well. Um, but uh, the, one, the one huge problem is nobody uses those cooling centers. Um, uh, they just don't. And we've been, I think there's been widespread concern throughout the country uh, about trying to figure out how you get them to. I know a few jurisdictions did advertising campaigns to convince people that that was a good idea. Um, we have limited dollars to buy air conditioners every year in May. The state uh, will buy about 400 air conditioners and pay to have them installed in people's homes if they prove they're vulnerable. Um, but I think, th so the mayor's office uh, convened a tabletop on this uh, that I went to, a tabletop exercise, um, about four months ago at the beginning of summer. And they asked for outside-the-box thinking. They wanted uh, any ideas. And... Um, it was rough. It was, you know, it was a hard one. Um, it was a hard one to solve, uh, and it's really about bringing bringing that cool air to people, but also convincing a lot of people <clears throat> that it's okay to use the air conditioner, um, that it's okay to be cold, or to be, it's okay to, it, yeah, it's okay to, to cool yourself, and that's a, a cultural thing, I think, for a lot of folks, um, and uh, it's a hard problem to solve, but it might be, yeah. So hopefully we're going to do something with that. But the mayor's office, one of the things they really want is they want to see how you use that list, the list of vulnerable populations, and how you do that during, a, during the heat event. Is it a, a phone call? Is it getting a neighbor to sign up on an app that then uh, is responsible for going over and checking on that person? Uh, there's a lot of good ideas, um, but uh, we, we haven't implemented anything yet. So it seems very clear that um, the city needs us too. Um, we need the city, and they need us because they're they're not enough. They don't have enough dollars to do everything, and they do seem to be trying to do good things and and uh, do good things. I've seen it when I was at this the shelter, but I wanted it to be more, of course, and. Um, so that's why we also have Wendy. So what I'm going to try to do now is start to wrap up um, this part. I think we could probably be talking to Jay for hours. Mm -hmm. um, but let me see how many questions people have for Jay. Let's just see if we can take them. All right. So, okay, those three people. I'll be really short. Okay. All right. This is a very short question. In my understanding, cooling centers are for people to go during the day like to a public library, but they still have to go home at night, right? Yes. So I'm not, yeah, there's I'm, a situation right there. Yeah. That needs looking into. And okay. that's so right. And and what we would consider a nighttime cooling center would be a, a shelter um, or an emergency shelter. So that that has been discussed. Like say, a, it's a a really bad heat wave, and a and a large building loses power, or a large building is so hot as to be dangerous, um, the city would need to set up a shelter. So they're thinking that they don't have it all figured out and they probably never will completely and that's why we need to help our neighbors. We need to have relationships with people that we can look after and they can look after us. 
Um, who else had a question? Go ahead. Um, is the cultural resistance to air conditioning? Louder, please. Louder. Um, are you saying people don't use their air conditioner, like they don't want to turn on their air conditioning because of like energy costs? Or? Uh, both energy costs and, uh, and like, uh, just, you know, I think they, there, there are studies that show even if you have the money, they, uh, there's a lot of folks that won't turn it on. Because they, they're, like, environmentally conscious, or? Uh, I think it's more they're tough. Oh. Like, like, they think it's not tough to turn it on. Okay. But it could be environmentally conscious. My other question is if there, what are, like, the other short and long-term ways to um, help keep the city cooler that aren't as energy intensive as... Groomers. Yeah. Like, is that something that's being considered, like, for future, like, construction projects in the city? Like, if we're thinking about future heat waves, how can we keep them cooler? That's definitely something. Um, million trees. Yeah. What did you say? The million trees program. Mm -hmm. Okay, Andrea. Yeah. So, just in terms of, we had mentioned homeless people. Speak louder, please. We had mentioned homeless people. Right. So the plans I have to kind of gather them, who's responsible for gathering them in a hurricane situation, getting them to an evacuation site. Sure. So, uh, oh, did you? It's a related question to oh. the question of homeless. But okay. One of the one of the things I've, I've worked with uh, Rock Climate Justice North, and we've been doing some activity in terms of homeless shelter on Broadway that they're trying to not open up. And one of, one of the things I've done research on is is to realize that. New York City, the home, number of homeless people is escalating exponentially. And it's escalating because the rents are rising. A lot of the laws, whether it's NYCHA housing and other things, have been moderated so that it doesn't have the impact to be able to afford. And so down the road, I, I just wonder what you see because I see that you know there's some areas that may not be able to be relivable given the warming climate, the warming oceans, the incredible storms that are happening. Property may be destroyed, homes may be destroyed. So uh, that's another big question that I think is connected to the situation because it's I mean, to not have a home, and even many of the homeless shelters are just like sleeping time and then out they go. No food. You know, I mean, I, yeah. there are so many people I do near Bedford uh, in the park. There are many homeless people in that park. And, you know, I try to give them a few bucks when I'm out there. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. But it's escalating to such an extent, and with this kind of potential, it makes it even worse. Right. So I'll, I think I can answer this quickly because there's I have an answer for one and not the other. So of the 65,000 people in the in the homeless system right now, um, they think the vast majority are, are 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 not street homeless. Right. That there's that there's three to six thousand street homeless in New York City that that are that that do not have a home and do not want to go into the shelter system. Um, the rest, they, you know, m the folks I work with normally call working, working homeless or working families that just can't afford rent in New York City. Um, so the street homeless uh, into shelters is uh, is a um, a problem that we we think we we have sort of solved in that um, there are there are teams from Department of Homeless Services as well as NYPD who go through the the subway system and then they have shuttle buses that actually drive to each subway stop and bring them to the hurricane shelters. The homeless also. Uh, um, Go to many of the hurricane shelters themselves, as, as you probably found out. Um, there are there there were quite a few, and then as far as the housing crisis that will be brought on by by you know climate change and global warming, I don't know if anyone has an answer to that because I think even without that, um, from what we understand, New York City is going to have a housing crisis no matter what. And uh, yeah. so we yes. have time for one last question. If it's short, Nas, okay. 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 Then maybe we can't take it. Can you come up with a short one? Well, she brought up the homeless crisis, and it has a lot to do with the real estate board and the mayor. And this is problem, and this is baby, and he won't do anything about it. And that the problem is the government is not involved in it. They have to, the homeless families that need to shelter, the homeless people, single ones, they have the choice either go in or not go in. But it's the families that have the problem with the homeless shelter. Okay, it's the real estate board is preventing all these families from getting an apartment. So this is a problem. It's Nas, the real estate board. Nas, I'm so. sorry to interrupt, but here's what I propose to help you get an answer. When we when we wrap up, 
Maybe you can talk briefly if Jay is willing to talk to you no, privately. No, back and tell the mayor that he has to get, get on the stick and fix that. That's his problem and he won't do anything about it. Okay. Okay, and if you want to talk to him some more, then please do. Thank you. So thank you very much. Sure, and I you. wish we had more time because you obviously have plenty more to say. And now I'm going to introduce Wendy again. Wendy is with MAP. MAP. Green MAP. Green MAP. I'm sorry. Green MAP. And um, she's done some wonderful projects at a much more local and smaller level that can be replicated. So please listen for ideas. And we're going to start with a four-minute video. So while it's getting set up, I'm going to ask you, what are the plans for bicycles in times of emergency in New York City? Is there an evacuation plan? Is there anything the city is doing right now as the number of bicyclers is booming? There is no emergency plan having to do with bicycles. Okay. So that's a really interesting problem we have. He's right brave, here. right? He has to tell the truth here. And, and we're asking hard questions. So, so okay. So anyhow, this video that we're going to see in just a second includes footage from Hurricane Sandy. We made it last year, though, in light of so many things going on. So hopefully we can pop it right on. Great. Uncertainty is the new normal. Let's take a look at how mutual aid can help us address disruption in our own communities. When disaster strikes or the grid goes down, what can bicyclers do to help? In 2012, New Yorkers found out Superstorm Sandy's flooded coastal neighborhoods and plunged swaths of the city into darkness. This was filmed just after the lights came on for all the Rockaway residents. With the subways, gas stations, and businesses closed, people jumped into action. We're here on the fossil fuel disaster relief ride. As you can see, there's still a lot of cars driving around here, uh, which is basically the problem. So we're demonstrating a solution. We're riding our bikes out here uh, with relief aid and also with an energy bike to charge phones and the free bike repair. Put a call out for cyclists, especially with trailers and cargo bikes, to join us for a ride from the Occupy Sandy Hub at 520 Clinton uh, with a lot of goods that can be distributed here, out here to the Rockaways. This is bike's breakthrough moment in terms of being used for their ability to be very flexible and deal with all kinds of emergency situations. Where the bikes make a ton of sense. Yeah, this is crazy, yeah. This 18 mile ride rolled past traffic jams and debris, moving food, water, medicine, and blankets right to where they were needed. We're going to do several things today. There will be some people that will stay and do bike repair and um, also work with the, the generators for cell phone charging. Um, and then some people will be working with Betsy and with um, the Rockaway Taco crew here on doing deliveries. So they have homebound people that they need to get specific food deliveries and supplies out to. Notice how the trailers were loaded. Balance loads, bungees. So somebody owes a trailer to take a couple things of water up to 101st to the people that are doing demo. Yeah? Okay. I am delivering a bunch of supplies that was requested for a family um, about a mile away. I uh, brought my doggy trailer today. Hey, my name's Barbara. I'm Carl. Carl. My nice pleasure. Maybe it's messed up here. This is a disaster area. I lost my home, I lost my car, I lost everything. Cold and hot, wet, hot. Dude, that's a blanket there. Yeah, the bags are here. Do you need some diapers? I'm sure. Yes. Here's some diapers. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's for you, Coco. <laughs> Even if you don't know how to fix a flat, you can have a basic set of tools handy, including a pump, patches, and spare tubes. Hey, you need your cell phone charge? Banners, social media, and word of mouth draw people who need help. Yeah, plug into that strip over there. Uh, yeah, we're gonna try again. Yeah. Bikes provide transportation, delivery, communications and reporting, even electricity, and if need be, evacuation. Cycling is an everyday climate change measure, and bicyclers help us build resilience so we can recover more quickly. And as you can see right now, the boardwalk is pretty much gone. This is not a situation where, you know, you're living in a bad neighborhood and you can get rid of that problem by moving to a better neighborhood. Right. It's not something you can stop. This is Mother Nature. You know, whenever it happens, it's going to happen. That's it. Now, let's get ready. 
talk about organizing for emergency response with your friends, other bike riders, and groups in advance of the crisis. Use our handy PDF to be bike ready in your own community. Through mutual aid, we can accomplish so much more. See greenmap.org slash bike ready. website so you can show this with your community group you can download the little PDF and organize the, the people and the tools you need in fact we left three sets of tools in emergency centers on the Lower East Side as part of this project which was funded by LES Ready so let me tell you how I got here LES home. meaning Lower East Side Ready yeah so I'm from, the, I'm from downtown yeah and you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work and then how it got me to where I am right now so I'm the director of something called Green Map, and Green Map is a project I started in 1992 because I wanted more people to connect with signs of progress towards sustainability in the city. We had a lot of things for green living. I put them on a map. People around the world asked me about that. Okay, so next slide. And it was this one, but it's not. Okay, yeah. Is that doing it? Yeah. No, that's right. Oh, I have to just hold Yeah. So very quickly, if you'll see it at greenmap.org, we share a symbol system that people now use all over the world who are making these maps. You can make one in your neighborhood, with a school, with your church. We are really happy to see all kinds of maps get made. We have a lot of engagement tools in several languages. Um, Go down. Keep going. Yeah. These are some of the climate change icons that we have. So we have 170 icons here people can actually point out in their community what's changing right on the map. You know, a print map is a record of time. An interactive map is something you can continually um, add to. We do that with both. Keep going. Um, and we're now in 65 countries. So there's about 1,000 cities now that have had green map projects. Some are led by the city. Some are led by grassroots groups. Our, map, our archives at New York Public Library. We'll go on. So here's one map that we made. In 2006, we made one about climate change, energy, and conservation in New York City. It took about three years to make. It was inspired by the blackout of 2003. So it included reasons to act now and the climate change predictions from Columbia University. We later put it on our interactive mapping platform, and we added Sandy's actual lines, flood lines, after it happened. So you can see there's solutions all over, but there's also problems. So I'll keep going. This map inspired people throughout our network to also make maps about climate change. So I pulled in a picture from uh, Thailand where in 60 communities, kids and city workers work together to point out climate countermeasures. And climate what? Countermeasures. Countermeasures. Right. And we did the same with young people in Staten Island. So this can be very much a bottom-up process, or it could be something that could actually be done in a city agency to look differently at the assets and liabilities that we have in a particular place. We've also been doing bike tours. This is one that, uh, this record represents some of the ones we did over the years. We've really been doing them for about 15 years. Why? Because when you bring people together on site, a whole new kind of ideas about how we can live and what we can achieve together start popping out. And so we were already doing that when Sandy happened, and that was 2012. I joined LES Ready, so that's the long-term recovery group on the Lower East Side, which has continued. I also was involved in a group called Local Spokes, which was make, uh, working on bicycle equity on the Lower East Side in Chinatown. I took part in the bike block during the climate march. And, um, oh, there's me presenting, whoops, this poster. I only have it in Spanish. I'm sorry, the English are long gone. But this is one of the things that LES Ready made after the storm. Where do you get all these different things you might need, whether it's translation and legal support, whether you still need um, medical help, whatever. But, you know, this has already passed. These no longer exist. That's five years ago. This group was very strong during the gas explosion on 2nd Avenue a couple years ago. Um, and we're ready for what comes, hopefully. It's 
50 community-based organizations working together. Um, okay, so that is that. We made this map as bike share hit the street the year after Sandy. I don't know if you remember, it was delayed and delayed. But we wanted people in our neighborhood of all um, backgrounds to be able to use the new system. All the little triangles on this map, and there's copies of it back by the door in Spanish and English, um, are the new bike share station. So we're calling this Lower East Ride. Use your bike as an everyday climate countermeasure. And it didn't happen until later that we started thinking about, wait, this footage tells us an important story, this sandy footage. How can we use it to continue that? So anyhow, we did the map. We also did a past, present, and future map. And what we see is tons more development happening in places where it shouldn't be happening because it's right on the edge. And it's not necessarily sustainable development. So that's where the inspiration for Bike Ready came from. I worked with my friend Peter Shapiro, who did most of the original footage. Also Barbara, she was with the dog trailer. She actually shot a lot of that as well. So it was a really interesting process to pull out the lessons from that. That New York City has done so much to encourage bicycling, but doesn't include them in the emergency planning is a really interesting gap. Maybe it's something we can collaborate on. OK, I'll show you how in a minute. So, I've been thinking we need a bike culture center, a bike innovation space, a place where people can learn to work on their bikes. And there are some that are temporary, that last for a while, but we need a real place. And in 2012, just before Sandy, I collaborated with um, the community coalition at Sarah Roosevelt Park to do a sustainability series. And what we were trying out were new ideas. They had a building. We want this building back from the Parks Department. It is full of, oh, wait a minute. Let me show you the location of it. See where it is, high and dry outside the flood zone? All of lower Manhattan is pretty much, this is the center point. So this building, which is currently full, and I'll show you what it's full of. Can you go to the next slide? Sorry. Is storage. We have the toilet paper for all of Manhattan Parks <laughs> on the Lower East Side. So not only is it creating more greenhouse gases, as trucks are coming from all over the city, all over the Manhattan, to pick up their supplies here, it was a community building. Not only was it one, there are 40 more in Manhattan alone that are being used for storage or underutilized by the Parks Department that were community centers closed in the 70s and 80s. So we see this as a really interesting community asset, and we want to create a new model for it. So, show, so this took us three years to get access to the building. By then, Margaret Chin, who's right here, our council member, had put in half a million dollars, so has Gail Brewer towards new bathrooms for this building. So on the next slide, you can see what happens outside this building. This park is only a little wider than the building itself. It's a long strip park. All day long, there's trucks coming and going in what's supposed to be a park space. So they're creating yet another hazard for the community. So, um, and you can see it's a little messy. There's a lot of homeless in this park. You must know, this just came up, 40% more homeless people this year than last year. So this park also has a very large population that nobody's trying to notice. And it's a really uncomfortable and unhealthy situation, an un uncivilized situation for all of us. So as we're thinking about what can this building be, and we did three visioning se um, sessions last year, we partnered with um, NYC Commons, and that's 596 acres, if you know them, they're about getting public land back, Common Cause, and the Urban Justice Center supported this effort and helped us do, and they did the mapping where the other 40 buildings were found and did a more to help move this project forward. But what we exposed people to was the idea of creating a climate action center, a community space where you can learn resiliency skills, where together, old and young, locally born or foreign born, whatever, you, we all have skills, we all have ideas, Let's start work, creating a space to work on these. Now, we're looking at one building, but this could actually be a model for parks, the future of parks. And I'll show you what else we added to it. And we have lots of help. Lots of groups have been pitching in. 
to, um, oh, we cut that off, but in any that case, passed. no, it's okay. It's, I cut it off. Um, the building then also had a series of indoor visioning sessions, and we gave people the floor plan. What would you like to see here? And we got back amazing ideas. These are the eight or so empty city-owned buildings just on the Lower East Side, just in our community. Um, so we had a great time with these. Gail Brewer came and was participated with us, among any others. And we realized, out of this, we actually need to be thinking about the homeless people as well. They're here in our parks. We're looking at libraries. How are the libraries working with homeless people? They're there all the time. Guess what? They have social workers. They have services for homeless people. You can borrow a necktie at a New York Public Library for a job interview if you want. I mean, there's a lot of heart there. We don't see that kind of interest yet coming from parks, but we're asking parks because virtually every problem that happens in this park now in some ways connected back to homeless people being there and having no place to go. So we want to now turn this building into both the Community Climate Action Center, a Homeless Navigation Center, and a third purpose, which is an Emergency Communication Center. Now, why do I say that? And I'm, I'll move up there. Our partners, by the way, are the Community Coalition in the park, University Settlement, and Green Map. So we're the three groups that keep pushing this forward. And here's our recent developments this year on this building. We um, testified at City Council on the Inaccessible Parks building at the end of the year. Our, uh, we've had about now over a dozen newspaper articles about this building and the situation, the vision. Um, we got letters of support from lots of organizations now. And we were just finalists for the Design Trust. And the design trust would have paid for fellows to come and help us to do the design work, do the policy work that we need to back this up. We didn't, we came in the top five, but what really was great was because we got these letters of support, we're continuing to push forward. And I'll show you what's next. So um, this is what's coming up. Oh, I left out a page. Interesting. We just had more coverage because we're, the Parks Department is now talking about finally, after promising in 1998 to get their storage out, they're actually working on it, we believe. So that's a really positive thing. The bathrooms are underway. They will be open by 2019. So keep holding it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more and more people in the community who are interested in this, this as a real tool for helping us get together and making change happen. So come and join us on, um, this is October 25th, we're partnering with Parsons School of Design and we're going to have a design session, an evening to talk about the building, the idea, what else can go there. So we'd love to have some of you join us. I have a handout in the back that has the events, I think I forgot to mention them when we were on the LES Ready page, but you actually who was it? Um, oh, she's gone. Catherine mentioned the march over the bridge. That's on this sheet. Um, that's the Climate Justice March. Sandy Ween is the event in our neighborhood on the 29th. This is the 25th of October, just before that. We're actually doing an uh, energy and biodesign bike ride next week for Climate Week. That's on the 20th. It's free and City Bike is loaning us a fleet of bikes. So if you've always wanted to try a city bike, I've never tried one. I bike every day. I'm going to use one. Um, if you want to join us, please RSVP soon. It's more than half filled already. We're also taking part in the Harvest Festival at the Smiling Hogshead Ranch, where I'm involved on this expansion of this permaculture farm into a bio-industrial park. So that's October 21. Is there anything else on here? I don't think so. Maybe one more slide. Yeah, just... So there's the organizations, the two URLs. Everything's on this little sheet, though. I did reuse the paper, so there's something on the back. Happy to answer questions. Yeah. Uh, Wendy, do you, have you at, uh, found out whether all these buildings in the park sound so useful? Are they above the blood plane? Some are and some aren't. So if, if you we go back to, um, oh, to how do you go back? Down. Down. OK, I'll tell you on the staff it's to go really far back. But a um, couple more. Anyways, um, I think we missed it already. Ah, sorry. 
Anyway, some are and some aren't. So you can overlay the flood zones. Is that it? Just this is it. Oh, okay. So just in our neighborhood, for example, the Baruch building, which is a four-story building, is way too close to um, the, river. the river. So we aren't looking at that. That's part of the reason we said this is an ideal building, because it's high and dry. It's also, in a way, a gateway to the neighborhood. So it would actually be able to proclaim that something important is going on here, whether you meant to be going there for that or not. It's, it's a very noticeable so it place. Serve as a shelter in a crisis. No, it would not. It, the idea in a shelter in a storm, not a shelter, but a place to charge up. It's got great solar access and a place to de make signage. So, how many people were here during Sandy and went into an area where it was blacked out and there was real difficulties going on. And the signage in my neighborhood would be a cardboard, piece of cardboard on the, stuck on a wall, and it'd say there's diapers and food here from one to three, somewhere. But there's no symbol system. There was nothing that helped people who didn't understand English to know what that meant. Occupy Sandy, though, worked on that. And if you went out to the Rockaways during that time, you would have seen these yellow and black signs that explain more clearly what was going on and where you got help. So part of the idea is that there's a communication center that, and that is one of the things that's lacking in an event like Sandy, where not necessarily the official side, because you're all connected, but the groups like the people who are out there on their bikes, or we just saw the Cajun Navy. How did the Cajun Navy get so many people saved? I don't know. Say if what the Cajun Navy is, just one sentence. Okay, so they were, you. they came, they came out of the woodwork during this floods in Katrina. Houston and voluntarily rescued people. So they started with Katrina, right? Yes. And this time around they used an app called Zelly, which is like a walkie-talkie on your cell phone. And it uses the text system. It has multiple systems for working in it. Because you don't know what's not going to be working until it happens. So we feel that if it's a communication center, a recharge center, and maybe it's got other aspects to it, but it might really help with some of the, the difficult things that are going on, when, especially as the storm continues. Like, we don't even hear about Houston hardly anymore in the, news, in the media, right? It's all about, yeah, it's all Ir Irma now. Huh? Right. That's right. That's right. So this is the reality is that it's not necessarily who's prepared or who's in the media that where you need help. So if you have a central place where you can find a, something that can help you deal with these, at least the communications piece. I'm a commun I mean, that's my background, mapping and communications. I really see that as a, a huge issue when it comes to disasters around here. How, how do we find out what's accurate, what's current, what's going on in our neighborhoods? So that's the concept. Who knows what will happen? Yes? Yeah, completely different. Um, I was wondering if, um, say the name of your group and your name. He, um, I work for the United for Action in New York City. And um, I, I was wondering if anything has been done or thinking about you know, doing tricycles. Because I think a lot of older people, <coughs> people who may not have the agility or balance and not feel comfortable riding a bike a lot, but would love to get into riding tricycles, and they also have a lot of basket-carrying That's very, very true. There's a lot of uh, cargo bikes in New York City. Maybe you've seen them, too, that are actually designed to carry a lot of stuff. Yeah. There's a cargo bike collective. That's, they do deliveries and stuff like that. What I find, well, my friend who has a tricycle, who lives in Fort Greene, she said she can't get it over the bridge. That the, the dynamics of that tricycle mm -hmm. make it hard for her to, to pedal uphill. Whereas a bicycle, you can do it. That's the only thing I know about tricycles. But it would be really interesting if New York City did have a bike innovation lab where we could develop this. How many people here have been to Copenhagen or Amsterdam and seen unbelievable number of bikes? 40% of anything that moves in, in Copenhagen is on a bike. Right. And actually, if you were curious about this, there's a wonderful website called Street Films. Dot org, and you can see very short pieces about transportation and mobility solutions that are human powered, that make good use of the new infrastructure like we have. All those buffered bike lanes, 
Wow, those are perfect for an emergency um, usage, you know? Not by motor vehicles, though, but by bicycles. We moved so much materials. We were lucky, folks, and you pointed out as well that Occupy Wall Street happened just a few months before Sandy, and that people were already organized. They were ready to hit the ground. They had communication systems. They were so good about moving materials and accepting donations. That house where we picked up those, where we dropped off materials and then went back to the other doors and fulfilled orders out in the Rockaways, that was the Saturday after. So that was super fast that that was on the ground and it went on for months. Mm -hmm. so. Donna? Yeah, yeah, because when I was watching that, that was like one of the questions I was wondering when this went on because, of course, when you're having a storm, you have water and you can't even get cars, so how are you going to get a bicycle? Bicycles can get through where cars can't. No, I'm talking about the water level. I mean, the oh. water level would be up to here. I mean, well, me, the know? sandy water went out immediately, right? We didn't exactly. have a second surge. There's low tide. The, the, the tide came in the next morning, and everybody was expecting a second surge, and we didn't have it. So our water came and went, unless it was stuck in your basement or something, came and went really fast. So in my neighborhood, my building was fine. My office was fine. We just didn't have power for five days. That was all. And I'm lucky. I have a sister who's blacked out all the time, often, and she lives in a rural area. She says, put your cooler outside and then leave it open at night and close it during the day. And leave. Our food never even spoiled. And that was October, so yeah. it wasn't bad. You might remember that it didn't rain after Sandy for months. The winter was very dry. It barely snowed. What we should have done in our neighborhood, but only Stuyvesant Cove Park did, was they watered and watered and watered. So they watered all those toxics out of their plants, and they didn't lose plants. But East River Park lost 80 mature trees. The neighborhood kept losing trees for the next two years. We're still seeing some effects like that. So. Andrea has a question. I was just wondering about your funding. Like where it's, we need more. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, like many small organizations right now, we're hurting. And that's true for almost any small group in the United States right now, that the, the funding goes to something like 93% of all environmental funding goes to 10 groups. 10 groups? Yeah. So, and I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what, which are the 10, but yeah, they're the ones with the big, the big NGOs. The big NGOs with the big budgets. The average not-for-profit in the United States spends 30% of its time raising money. We said we're not going to do that. We said we're just going to do the work. So as a result, we are a very low-budget operation. We do get donations. We do get donations and we get grants and things, but it ain't easy. So what did we get for to produce the bike ready video? We got 750 bucks to produce the video and the guide to go with it and three toolkits. And when they saw the video, they said, if we give you another 750, what will you do? And we said, we'd make a Spanish, Chinese, and we were lucky somebody said, I'll do the Japanese version. So that's, the money went really right to the media there and right to the people who pitched in. So. Do you want any of these people to help you? Do you, do you yeah. need help on the ground? Do you got a sign-up sheet somewhere? When? I'm, we're going to get a copy of the same sign-up sheet that everybody signed in here. So we'll add you, if you want, to our mailing list. You can opt out on the first time whenever we eventually send a notice out. Yes, Gusty? Hi. Yeah, um, this is a little bit off topic, but not really because it's about infrastructure. Uh, tomorrow there's an election. And they're, they're trying to um, amend the Constitution, which I totally recommend against, because they want to fast track infrastructure. This is basically, uh, you know, the intent behind amending the Constitution, of the state Constitution. And the infrastructure that they want to put in is, of course, pipelines, compressor stations, frack gas, power plants, all of that stuff that we don't need that is spurring climate change. So I recommend everybody vote no against the Constitution Convention. I'm with you. On, I'm with you on that for a different reason, and that's because the money, the oil money that's going into supporting um, how many states is it that now have said yes, we'll have a constitutional convention? It's a lot. We're on a tipping point, so New York State has to say no. Thank you for bringing that up. So, 
So Wendy, we're going to uh, wrap up with what you're doing and just see if there are any questions for both of you, okay? So um, we could obviously have more time with both of these speakers, but I think the, the cross-pollination uh, is good, yeah. right? The two of you are getting a dialogue going, right? right? And I well, can see... And we I, need OEM's help to make this vision come true, right. you know, if, if there is to be a community climate action lab slash homeless navigation center slash emergency charge space. We all need to work together. That's several agencies right there. And Department of Homeland Sur Ho Homeless Services is already involved, as is a little bit parks. But we need and now we have a friend in the city that we have probably <laughs> others. Yeah. And maybe you can tell us who else we should talk about in the future, right? Maybe like sure. other agencies and things. And, it, and if you, and, and I can get great contacts for our uh, community-based disaster planning great. folks that they talk to LDS Ready a lot. Because I know we worked with LAS Ready at the, like, as you said, the Second Avenue fire uh, gas explosion. Um, so they're they're one of the, I think, the biggest community-based organization in the city. Well, we're full of innovators in our neighborhood, and a lot of people who have done, who have proven you can do quite a bit successfully. Our neighborhood has 50 community gardens in our neighborhood. I helped get us helped us get a two million dollar governor's. Office of Storm Recovery Grant, we're now building green infrastructure in those 50 community gardens in a largely paved neighborhood where, yeah, one day we may get a barrier from the east, a storm surge barrier, but the water coming down is causing all kinds of problems, including CSOs. So we'd love to talk more. Yeah. So who else has questions for both of them? Do you want to come, come back up a little so you can... Wherever you want to be, sit or stand. You want to bring your chairs up? Okay. Yeah. I'll bring them. Okay. So, who has questions for both of them, or either or? Because we have a few more minutes and we'll have to vacate. And before people leave, I have a request. We ask for donations. It's not required. We don't suggest an amount. But for the Grassroots Alliance to do these events, we do have expenses. We have to pay uh, Ethical Culture a monthly fee. and make photocopies for things and handouts. So we would appreciate uh, contributions. I'm just going to circulate this while we're taking the last few Q&As. So would you help with this? Take it around. You have a question? Yeah. yeah. So one of the things we've been hearing is how much progress has been made since Katrina. And so I wanted to get your take. Like, it sounds to me like there's formal organization. It sounds like there's been a lot more progress in terms of coordinating agencies in this city. And I just would like to hear you say those words, that there really has been a lot of progress in the last several years, that we're learning a lot and we're using it. Sure, um, I, I can say those for sure. I, uh, I started in 2009. Um, I have, there was a distinct feeling in the, in the city uh, among the partners. I mean, we, so I talked to 19 agencies with the Coastal Storm Plan very regularly. Before Hurricanes Irene and then especially Hurricane Sandy, those conversations were um, abstract. Uh, they're, they're much different, obviously, now. We have the attention of the mayor's office in everything that we do, and we have uh, funding um, to do it. So uh, it's a, it's a, it, it is different, and the city's done a lot of work. Good. you say that. But. 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 It all depends on how you define progress. Relatively speaking, so, we, know we have a long way to go. So I have been to thousands of preparedness meetings for the last five years. We have wonderful plans, none of which are have spades in the ground yet. And the most vulnerable of the populations, the next Sandy that comes up, the Lower East Side is going to get flooded tomorrow afternoon, should it happen, God forbid. The Rockaways are going to get flooded. All of the most vulnerable communities are still vulnerable after all of these things. And the reason partly for this is that the city is looking to make these Taj Mahal processes where it's great, the plans are great, but it'd really be nice to put in something like a simple concrete barrier temporarily 
to take care of what might just happen because time is passing by and the percentages increase for future flooding. And now I'm talking about flooding and not about heat. And believe me, I've been through all this stuff a lot. And as far as mitigation planning goes, which you're referring to, uh, yeah, in, if I could answer the question in, in terms of that, very little has been done. Um, the the seawall uh, projects that were talked about after Sandy um, were, you know, were not constructed. I know that the flood protection management that's in place in some neighborhoods like Red Hook and Hunts Point is to a level of a... Uh, I think a, a 10 year storm, so it's not even, it won't even protect them against flooding from, uh, from some storms that they could, they could see a lot of. Um, I will say that where, where it came to the low hanging fruit, the, the not mitigation planning, but response planning and recovery planning, the city went, went very hard and, and that's, that was, uh, you know, our, our job. Um, but as far as the structure stuff, no, it, they, they could never get it together. Um, and the, I mean, they're still trying. What's that? It's, I mean, what you really need is wetlands to absorb the, the, you know, the storm surges and permeable a, um, asphalt and stuff like that to absorb the water. I mean, I don't think yeah. barriers are the way to go. Well, there's two kinds of you know water. There's the surge and there's the rain. Yeah. And like on the Lower East Side, where we're supposed to, we're, our neighborhood won three hundred and thirty-five million dollars, but all that planning is now on hold. So, this is for the Big U. Do you know about this project that supposedly funded the whole eastern and southern tip now? But there's nothing happening at all, as far as I know. Is no, that right? uh, in that, and we learned uh, the politics of that early. It has, it was incredibly difficult to get even those structures set up in Red Hook because um, the money comes and then comes the permitting process and all of this other stuff that I, I honestly I can't talk to it very much, but I know that um, the planners in my office who have been on that for the last three years have been incredibly frustrated. Um, uh, but maybe this, which we just, all of us, you know, wasn't here, but we all experienced Harvey and Irma, and maybe Jose, but maybe this will be the, to help push this conversation a little bit further along, because, I don't know about you, but I did definitely saw images that compared, here's a building as it was flooded in Katrina, here it is in how it was flooded in August, same, no difference. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just ask a quick question. How many of you are, might be interested in helping the Grassroots Alliance? And if so, I just want to give you an email, a, a, a card to just put your name and contact information and write a note about what you could do to help us. Because we could use help. Uh, we would be more effective if we had a little more help. So just raise your hands and I'll give you these cards. I don't want to interrupt for too long. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, another quick, quick question I want to ask in the middle of this almost ending is would anybody be interested in a brainstorming session about what you could do in your communities? Would you like that to be scheduled by the Grassroots Alliance? Or does that sound too vague? Or what do you think? Is there some you'd be interested, interested Andrea? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. How about if I give you both cards and say that on them too, and maybe I'll introduce you. Put your neighborhood on it. Like, where do you, which neighborhood do you live in? Okay, Upper West Side, Lower East Side. Okay, anybody else want to get involved with that? You? Well, can I, can I just suggest that we get like maybe more groups to sponsor an event like that, like 350 and sure. Yeah. I just write me a sure. remind me. Thank sure. you. You know what might be useful for that is LES Ready's report, their guide is coming out. And um, Sandy's fifth, so this next, the end of next month, right. and it includes a, a scenario. And then we practice these scenarios. It was actually really interesting, and it only took about 45 minutes, but it really <coughs> helped you understand how do you work with the city, especially after um, a disruption. Okay. Yeah, you know, talk. The, the, there's one other thing too that we should not forget. And that is there are a lot of local grassroots groups that are doing this kind of work in addition. 
I work, for example, with We Act up in northern Manhattan. We're working on a kiosk kind of an approach where we're going to have information and the ability in the event of a real emergency for people to gather and give them materials and we'll work. And supposedly that will be the first of many that we're going to be setting up. I know down in Red Hook, uh, RH, uh, Red Hook Initiative, uh, Fifth Amazing. Avenue Committee, there's a lot of different groups. So if you really want to find a local group, you can find one. And we act, by the way, I want to just give a plug. Uh, if you haven't been to one of WEAC's meetings, they're up in Hamilton Heights, I think. Uh, it's 151st and uh, Amsterdam. In the West. They, do, they have great meetings um, monthly on the second Saturdays, and Lou actually got me to one, and now I'm very interested in showing up for those. They're very good meetings. I recommend that you consider just see what they're doing. Just go to one even on a second Saturday of the month. Look at their website. Um, Adam had his hand up. Okay, Adam. Sorry, I didn't see you. Hi. Um, quick question. About, what do you think about um, like these uh, flood prevention mega projects? You know, they're, I've seen you know ideas like movable barriers across the Arizona Straits, or even like you know these twenty foot, five foot high, or whatever they are, uh, levees down the Rockaway Peninsula and across. You know, depending on what you want, because they're. You know, I guess they have something, they have a smaller version of this in London with the Thames Barrier. Which they've used once, right, in the years since they put them up? I think they've used it maybe a dozen times. Really? Like for, for little things, you know, because they, they have flooding all the time, it's like high tides. But yeah, I think once for something. Something big. Um, but, you know, because they're spending a lot of money, I know, you know, reinforcing the subways and things, supposedly, I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's one of the reasons they're shutting down the health chain, I think. But, um, you know, I guess if, uh, as, you know, sea levels rise and these storms become more powerful and maybe more frequent, you know, is, was that something, I don't know, just, you know, putting that out there, is that, would that be, like, more cost-effective than trying to sort of fix things re repeatedly as these storms keep coming? Yeah. Uh, I think what Gusty pointed out, the wetlands, you know, that we need, can use natural systems, the oysters, which there is a small project going on around um, as a way to break up the waves. I just read in Havana, what did they, how did they use the mangroves, mangrove forests? Now, we do not have a protective coastal forest like that, mm -hmm. but they were able to put all kinds of stuff in there and protect it. Like, so they didn't lose boats. If you look at the footage from, you know, uh, anywhere in Florida, there's a million broken boats. But, we can learn a lot from a country like Cuba, and yes, it's a, it's a country that says, okay, you're evacuating, you've got no choice. But they also move everybody's valuable stuff. So nobody feels like, I have to stay here so I don't lose my computer in my fridge. And they put all that stuff on trucks and they move it out of the way. So that is one thing they've learned. They also trim trees before the storm. So, so there's less likely to be damage. It's interesting. Yeah. So we really do have to stop. Let's thank both of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much.